thanks for joining us for this um, lunchtime webinar to look at what we mean by a healthier and more sustainable diet and some tips for how we can eat well, <coughs> both, both for you and for the planet. Um, now, Claire mentioned this maybe just a moment ago, but I'll say just again for anyone else who is joining, if you do have any questions as we go through, then if you please put those into the chat box and make sure that it's set to everyone um, so that everybody can see these questions, we'll try to answer as many of them as we can at the end. Okay. So just firstly, a little bit of an overview of the sort of main questions that we'll look at today, which are, well, firstly, why do we need to change our diets? And then a little bit around what we actually mean by a healthier, more sustainable diet and some of the factors we need to consider. And then perhaps most importantly, what positive changes can we make to our diets to try to move in the direction of being healthier and more sustainable in what we eat? So firstly, I'm sure many of you are um, already aware of this, but of course, what we eat and how we produce, how we consume and how we dispose of this has a large impact, uh, both in terms of people, but also <clears throat> in terms of the planet as well. If we think on the uh, people side, we know that about one in five deaths globally is due to a poor diet. And that includes factors such as a high salt intake or low intake of things such as uh, whole grains. And globally, over about 2 billion adults are either overweight or obese, but at the same time, about 500 million are underweight. And when we look on the planetary side, the food that we produce is responsible for about somewhere between a quarter to about a third of all greenhouse gases. Uh, th there are different estimates out there. And the majority of fresh water use globally, almost three quarters, and also about 40% of land use globally. And so the diets that we consume and the way that we produce them currently is not really serving either our personal or planetary health very well. And so this is why we need to look to make changes. And alongside this, we know, of course, that we have a growing global population that's set to reach almost 10 billion people by the middle part of this century. And alongside that, that's predicted to increase global demand for food by about 50%. And um, also demand for animal-based foods by about 70% as incomes rise, particularly in developing nations. And so putting all of this together, it raises this very important question of how we can continue to feed a growing population in a healthy way that can also reduce these environmental effects of food production that we have currently. But before we kind of come into that, I think it's important to try to define a bit more, well, what do we mean by healthier and more sustainable? What factors do we really need to consider in here? I think many of us probably think about low environmental impacts, some of the factors that I just mentioned on that first slide. But there are other things that we need to think about as well, ideally. We should also think about, of course, health. What is nutritionally adequate? So do we get good, good quality nutrition, um, both vitamins, minerals, fiber, other important things in the right amounts from our diet? But also, of course, very importantly, particularly at the moment, is, our, is the diet that we have available to us, is it also affordable? Is it accessible? And also, is it culturally acceptable as well? These are all important factors that we need to try to consider and to try to balance out as best as possible when looking at uh, what a healthier, more sustainable diet is and the choices that we make. Now, the good news is that one, we do have some idea of, uh, of potential ways in which we can eat to do this. The Eat Well Guide, for example, which is the UK's healthy eating, official uh, healthy eating model, and shows the proportions of foods that we should aim for in our diet and in which amounts, is a style of eating that is can provide us with a more plant-rich or plant-based, if you like, way of eating, but that can also include some nutrient-rich animal-based foods as well. And it's important to mention that we don't need to cut these out of our diets entirely in order to be, uh, to be more sustainable. And studies have shown that if we followed the Eat Well Guide more closely in the UK, that this could have both environmental benefits as well as benefits for our health as well. For example, about 30% lower greenhouse gas em emissions, which of course are linked to climate change, as well as uh, reducing water use and also 
the number of new cases of some important uh, uh, chronic diseases like type 2 diabetes, uh, heart disease and stroke as well. And so the third question and most important one to come on to is, well, how can we make some positive changes to our diets and to what we eat? It's important to say, firstly, that there's no one size fits all solution. We are different um, as individuals and our, our needs are different. But there are some positive changes that we can all try to make to improve both our health and the health of the planet as well. Now, the different areas that I will talk about are linked to the themes for this year's Healthy Eating Week, which is, of course, on this subject. And I, I believe most of you are already registered for this, but if you have not um, yet registered, then please do. So you can be involved and access as many of the resources that we've produced to support your Healthy Eating Week uh, as possible. So the first area is to focus on fiber. So the evidence shows that we need to get more um, foods such as fruits, vegetables, whole grains, pulses, nuts, seeds into our diet. And these are important because they can provide not only vitamins and minerals, but they can also provide us with fiber, which is good for a number of reasons I'll talk about in a moment. Also, another area that many of us are aware of as being important to get our five a day of fruit and vegetables. And thirdly, to vary our protein intake. So we don't necessarily need to cut out um, meat, fish, dairy, or eggs from our diet entirely to be, to be more sustainable. But we do need to look at the balance of protein sources in our diet and to look at how we can choose more plant-based uh, sources. Also, staying hydrated is another important uh, factor for our health. And there are some ways we can do this that we can also be more environmentally sustainable with as well. And lastly, possibly the most uh, important area irrespective of whatever type of diet we choose to eat, is reducing our food waste, because this can be a driver of climate change. So I'd like to look into each of these areas now and each of the themes for Healthy Eating Week in a little bit more detail and try to offer a few practical suggestions for how we can try to take action in each area. So firstly, we know that fibre is important for our gut health but it can also reduce the risk of several diseases like heart disease, stroke, and type two diabetes. And so aiming to get more fiber into our diet is important and something that on average, we don't manage to do in the UK at the moment. You can see in the top right, the recommendations that we have uh, for fiber in the UK for adults, but also as well for um, children and adolescents. And one way we can do this is to aim for more ways to get fruits, vegetables, whole grains, um, beans, peas, lentils, nuts and seeds into our diet. And now these are just a few suggestions and I have some more as well for the other areas which we'll come to in a moment. And there are other ways that we can do this, but a few examples include um, having a whole grain breakfast, um, a whole grain breakfast cereal, sorry, at, at breakfast time and adding on, for example, fruit uh, or nuts or seeds or when we're shopping, trying to switch to whole meal varieties of bread, but also things like wraps, bagels, chapatis, or pita breads. Um, also, going for a, a small handful of nuts or seeds, unsalted ones, um, as a snack. Or also trying to have healthier snacks as well throughout the day, things like uh, hummus and vegetable sticks, or perhaps um, sliced fruit, for example. And this is particularly important for um, younger children, um, for trying to establish healthier eating habits and a liking for fruit and vegetables at an early age. Now, the second area is around trying to get our five a day. We all know this is an important area. Fruit and vegetables provide us with not just vitamins and minerals, but also fiber. And they also tend to have a lower environmental impact as well than some other foods. And we should aim for a variety of at least five portions a day. And a portion is about 80 grams. And what that actually looks like, you can see a few examples of in the blue box there. So it could be a medium sized piece of fruit, like a banana, apple, pear, or a dessert bowl of uh, salad, or three, three heaped table, tablespoons of uh, cooked vegetables. But at the moment, we know that only a third of adults in the UK on average, and and fewer than one in eight adolescents actually manage to get their five a day. And so this is an important area for our, our health. And again, these are just a few suggestions. There are lots of ways in which we can do this, but we can try to snack on fruit and veg more throughout the day. 
for example, um, I usually try to keep a couple of pieces of fruit by my computer uh, in the morning. So something to, to snack on whilst I'm working throughout the day is a, is a healthier option. Also, going for fruit-based uh, desserts um, with meals. We're also um, trying out uh, seasonal fruit and vegetables. So, for example, um, British strawberries or asparagus, things that are that are in seasonal and produced in the UK. This can uh, be a good way, of course, to support um, UK farmers and producers. And in the bottom left as well, you can see, we can also try to find as many opportunities as possible to add either fresh, but also frozen or canned vegetables into recipes as well. So it could be adding some um, uh, frozen veg into a uh, stir fry, for example, or, a, um, or something into a, um, a dish that we're cooking like a, a chili con carne, for example. And this can be a really good way um, to try to meet our five a day goal. And the third area is around varying our protein intake. So as I mentioned before, we, we don't need to cut out um, animal-based uh, protein foods from our diets entirely, but we do need to think about trying to eat a wider variety of protein foods and choosing plant sources more often, things like beans, peas, lentils, nuts and seeds. And plant proteins tend to be lower in saturated fat, but it also Growing pulses, for example, can improve the health of soil and can reduce the need for fertilizers because they can naturally fix nitrogen into the soil um, when they are grown. And as I mentioned, a healthier and sustainable diet though does not need to cut out meat, fish, eggs, or dairy or eggs entirely, and can also include some meat alternatives as well, things like tofu, microprotein, or soy meats. And again, these are just a few suggestions. There are lots of ways we can try to do this that fit in with our own routine, but you might want to think about, for example, adding pulses to meals. So it could be um, adding chickpeas to, to curry, uh, adding beans into a beef uh, bolognese, for example. Um, or as you can see in the, in the picture there, maybe something like a salad with chickpeas, um, which is a, a, a favorite in our, in our house and is something that's quite quite an easy um, midweek meal to do. I'm also swapping half of the meat uh, for things like beans or lentils in dishes as well as another option. And also trying to think about uh, trying different types of things like pulses, like beans that we might not have, uh, have had before. We can, can often find these in supermarkets now and maybe on the world foods aisle. And the last um, area is around seafood. Now it's recommended, as I'm sure you, you probably know, that we ha have two portions of fish per week, and we should have one of those as an oily um, fish. But of course, over there, we do have issues with overfishing. But it's believed that if we do more to support more sustainable options, then this can help to protect fish stocks and uh, make sure that the industry is more sustainable in the future. And you can see a few examples there of some marks that focus on different aspects of um, of the environment around or, or, or welfare around um, seafood that we can try out, such as the blue MSC or the green ASC logo as well. And you can find these nowadays in a lot of the supermarkets, including on own brand products. And so it doesn't necessarily need to be um, a more expensive option. Now, the fourth area is around hydration. So it's recommended we should aim for about six to eight cups or glasses of fluids each day. But we might need more than that if we are more active, exercising a lot, or if we, um, uh, if we are in, a, uh, in summer, for example, when the weather is hotter. And drinking plenty can stop us from becoming dehydrated, of course, and that even mild dehydration can affect, for example, our concentration or lead to things such as headaches. And so it's important that we try to stay hydrated throughout the day. And of course, we can do this with reusable drinks containers that can help to reduce single-use packaging. Water is an excellent choice because it hydrates us without providing any extra calories. And other options also include things like unsweetened tea and coffee, herbal uh, infusions, low fat milk, also fruit and vegetable juices and smoothies, which do provide uh, some vitamins and minerals and can be an option. But it's recommended we try to limit this to a total of about one small glass per day. And the reason that is that these can be a these can be acidic and contain sugars, which can be damaging for teeth. Now, a few options for how we can do this include 
for example, um, flavoring tap water with something like sliced fruit or cucumber to add some flavor. Also trying to use a, a reusable uh, water bottle and keeping it uh, with you throughout the day. I've got my one here now. Um, and also going for recyclable and recycled um, drinks containers when you, do, when you do buy drinks as often as possible. And as I mentioned before, trying to uh, being aware that you might need to might need to drink more in hotter weather or if we're being more uh, physically active. Now the final area I'd like to talk about where we can make some positive uh, changes and that is our final theme for Healthy Eating Week is around reducing food waste. Food waste feeds climate change and is bad also for it's bad for both our pockets and the planet. And the reason for this is that well food waste accounts for anywhere between eight to 10% of all greenhouse gas emissions globally, which are, of course are a driver of climate change. But also food waste, it's estimated in the UK, costs the average household with children about 60 pounds a month. And so this is of course an important consideration, not just for the planet, but also for, uh, for, for ourselves as well, particularly in, at the moment with the current um, cost, of, cost of living crisis. And so, Again, these are just a few suggestions, but some of the things that we can do, and you will find some tips and resources for these and the other themes as well um, on our website to support um, the different themes of Healthy Eating Week. But a few suggestions are, um, for example, planning ahead to write a shopping list uh, before we go. So we get the things that we need and the things that we want for the week for the, uh, for the meals that we have planned. Also checking food labels to make sure we store food correctly, but also to potentially avoid throwing it away. So um, checking the different, uh, ensuring that we know whether a food is has a best before date rather than use by date, for example. Um, and also setting our fridge to the correct temperature <clears throat> of about naught to five degrees, which of course can mean that foods last longer. But in the UK on average, most uh, fridges are set to about seven degrees, so a bit above this. And that might link in with this, the stat that you see in the top right there, which is that in the UK, we pour away nearly 3.1 million glasses um, of milk down our kitchen sinks every day. And so setting our fridge is one way that we can um, try to avoid this. And another suggestion is to try uh, batch cooking and to try to find creative ways to use up leftovers. So if we do, if we do have um, some freezer space and we're able to batch cook, it can be a great way, of course, when we have time to make sure that when we're perhaps busier during the week, for example, that we have something um, as, a, as a healthier and easier uh, quick option during the week. And so hopefully that gives a good overview of the reasons around, well, why it is important that we need to think more about the way that we, not just both for our, our health, but also for the health of our planet as well. But that when we do this, there are a number of different things that we need to think about. So not just um, the environment, but also nutrition and health. And of course, as well, what's affordable, accessible and what's culturally acceptable. And hopefully in those um, examples that we looked at, there are a few uh, ideas there for you of how we can do this and how to try to balance out all of these different factors that go together. And following the Eat Well Guide as a general um, model is one way we can do this that is likely to have both health and environmental benefits. And of course, there are some actions that we looked at where we can that we can all take to help us to eat well uh, for ourselves, but also for the planet. And I think it's important to mention that small changes can have a very big difference when we all do these together. And so it's really trying to focus on what small things we can do that fit with our um, our own personal preferences and budget and lifestyle so that we can um, shift what we eat in the right positive direction. And so just before uh, we finish and move on to the questions, um, I've mentioned it a few times already, and I know many of you are already registered, but we do have, of course, next week, our um, Healthy Eating Week, and the different areas that were mentioned here linked to the five themes for the week. If you've not yet registered them, please um, do go to our website and, and register so that you have access um, to all of the resources and uh, everything, the activities that we'll be doing throughout the week. And just to highlight um, a couple of examples um, of the activities and resources we have available, um, you can see here, for example, a uh, we have a fiber pack snack builder, 
We have fruit and veg tracker, and these are just two of the many resources that we've got for, um, <clears throat> for schools, early years, workplaces, um, to help support your healthy eating week. And we'd really love to hear about what you are doing uh, during Healthy Eating Week next week. Please do let us know um, via the email you see there, postbox at nutrition.org.uk. And also, please get involved on social media as well. You can see our handle at nutrition.org.uk. And also, we have the hashtag uh, HEW22. Uh, We'd love to hear and to see what you are doing uh, across the different themes for the week. And so I just remain to say thank you very much, everyone, for listening. Hopefully that was um, a useful overview uh, of healthy and sustainable diets. And I'd like to um, move on to answer any questions that you might have, if I can uh, maybe ask my colleague Ewan to step in. Thanks, Simon. Um, yeah, so we had a, a lot of discussion in the chat there. Um, lots of really interesting discussion. Um, we had a few people, Kim, Amanda and Jacqueline, who um, are doing a lot of, of great work um, around this. Um, <clears throat> I'll try and distill the, some of these points into questions, as I'm not, they weren't necessarily questions directly. Um, but Kim was talking about some cookery work, workshops that she runs to help um, people sort of utilise foods like uh, lentils, chickpeas, butter beans, uh, etc., and do this um, um, on a budget. So I suppose, I suppose the question would be kind of, um, you know, what's what's the 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 easiest way to try and um, get people learning about these uh, and able to kind of use these foods? I know you talked about accessibility um, and and kind of any, I guess, any advice on how to overcome those kind of barriers to foods that people might not be aware of. Yeah, um, absolutely. That sounds like some really interesting, uh, interesting work that, that Kim is doing, and it's it is yeah a very important area. I think uh, pulses are potentially yeah quite quite underutilized, but we maybe don't eat them very often or a very wide variety maybe in the UK. And so, I suppose maybe one place to start is in what's available in terms of canned um, beans, uh, chickpeas, and other pulses uh, can be um, fa fairly quite quite affordable and also um quite sort of convenient as well and if we go for canned options and of course that's something we can we can keep hopefully keep in the cupboard and that we um is <clears throat> we're able to to store for a longer time and so that can maybe sort of cut potentially cut down on waste um but yeah it, it, it can be quite it can be quite challenging but i think it's finding um some different uh pulses or things that we can maybe substitute into dishes that we that we typically cook uh, and that um, we know uh, we can do sort of fairly affordably and fairly efficiently. Um, for example, I, I mentioned in there about sort of swapping out pulses for meat in some dishes as an option. Um, but yes, it's um, it, it, it is quite uh, sort of challenging to know how to do, how to do this, but it is uh, it's something that we can do alongside other things like also make, uh, adding fruit and vegetables to dishes to try to maybe to uh, to to sort of bulk those out where we can, uh, and that's another way we can kind of get towards having five a day. Yeah, great. And there was there was some discussion around kind of the half and half approach um, as well, and um, saying that this is a useful kind of way to get people engaged. Um, so thank thank you for that. Uh, we had a question from Yvonne. Um, do we know how much eliminating food waste alone might contribute to reducing climate change versus other dietary changes. So I suppose what she's asking is the, the relative impact of reducing food waste compared to, I don't know, reducing meat consumption, for example. Ooh, um, yeah, um, excellent question. Um, I I think it, I, well, I, I mean, I showed the statistic in there on the one slide that it's the, the, um, the, well, it's the IPCC, so the Inter Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change that um, deals with all of the, assessing the evidence and all the big reports around climate change they have they estimated and included in one report that it's anywhere up to 10 percent of all greenhouse gas emissions are, are related to food and another another statistic is that um if food waste were a country it would be the third largest um emitter of greenhouse gases globally and so it is definitely a very large problem and i think it's very it's important to stress that it's one that no matter what type of diet we eat or what kind of changes we make to our diet unless we really cut down on on food waste um it will you know it will cancel out maybe some of those other positive uh, choices that we make and so it really is a very important area in terms of its um relative size of impact um i'm not particularly sure but i think it as i mentioned it is a very big 
um, issue, no matter what type of diet we're consuming, whether we are um, having an omnivorous diet, flexitarian, um, pescatarian, vegetarian, vegan, it's an important issue no matter what. And I think we also need to be aware of if we are changing and if we're shifting our diets to try to have more plant-based foods, that we try to make sure we're not wasting more um, foods, particularly things like fruit and vegetables, um, if, yeah. we're, if we're struggling to find ways to use them in time. Yeah, thank you, Simon. And um, we had actually a few bit of conversation about kind of ideas for reducing food waste as well. So people were talking about buying uh, smaller packages and batches to reduce food waste, making weekly timetables, um, and increasing the frequency of shopping, which obviously it might be more or less um, difficult for for certain people. Um, and we had one more question, which is a uh, a tricky one. It's a big one. What would you say is the single most important message to send to children on this subject? Mm. Um. Yeah, <laughs> it's an interesting one. I think children and younger people, uh, there, I mean, there is definitely a lot of, um, we hear a lot now around, like, for example, climate anxiety. And I think it, it you know, it is a, it is very sh- uh, stressful potentially for younger people growing up now, seeing the, the issues that we're having in terms of, of climate change and other issues around sustainability. And so I think maybe one message both for children, but also for adults and everybody really, is that small changes can make a big difference. There have been, for example, um, studies, modeling studies, but looking at the US population. So um, not that dissimilar to us, where they've shown that even substitute making small substitutions between foods in our diet can actually reduce the greenhouse gases of the diet um, quite a lot. So I think the thing is, small changes can make a big difference when we do them all together. And so I think that's a positive message hopefully great and we've got a couple more things coming in uh do just stop me um because we've got lots of great engagement in the chat um we had a couple of people talking about um best before and used by dates and about the difference between those um just a there's a simple explanation for those yep yeah i think yeah it is very important because there is there are surveys showing that there is you know confusion around this and that that might be a bit of a driver of, of food waste and best before dates of course they, they, they usually relate to the quality of a product and so it's it if it still smells and tastes okay it can be okay to consume after that date whereas use by dates should not be um exceeded because that is a, an issue of food safety um although having said that um there are a few supermarkets for example uh, recently that are announcing changes to their labeling and removing uh, for example use by dates off of own brand milk um to make to prevent people from throwing this away so that they can um smell and maybe taste to decide whether or not it's gone off but generally speaking yeah it's important that we think about best before dates for quality use and um use by dates in terms of food safety that we shouldn't go beyond 